Okay, now we are going to read the introduction to the language of the goddess written by Maria Gimbutas. The purpose of this book is to present the pictorial, quote, script for the religion of the old European great goddess, consisting of signs, symbols, and images of divinities. These are our primary sources for reconstructing this prehistoric scene and are vital to any true understanding of Western re religion and mythology. Some 20 years ago, when I first started to question the meaning of the signs and design patterns that appeared repeatedly on the cult objects and painted pottery of Neolithic Europe, they struck me as being pieces of a gigantic jigsaw puzzle, two-thirds of which was missing. As I worked at its completion, the main themes of the old European ideology emerged, primarily through analysis of the symbols and images and discovery of their intrinsic order. They represent the grammar and syntax of a kind of meta-language by which an entire constellation of meanings is transmitted. They reveal the basic worldview of old European, pre-Indo-European pre culture. So the Indo-European language family came out of Central Asia and kind of spread across the whole Eurasian continent. But prior to that language invasion, which was about 3500 BC, there were, there were earlier cultures. Symbols are seldom abstract in any genuine sense. Their ties with nature persist, to be discovered through the study of context and association. In this way, we can hope to decipher the mythical thought, which is the reason de terre of this art and its basis in its form. So I wrote this note here when I read it the first time, more iconic than the symbols of today, indexical, right? So it, we have, in the semiotic theory of Charles Sanders Peirce, there are three ways of referring to things. You can have icons, which refer because of their similarity, like a portrait. You could have indices, which refer because of because of association. So when there's smoke, there's fire. They're associated with each other in time and space. And then there's symbols, which refer due to complex webs of meaning, or by code, or by law, or by convention. And when we think of symbols, we tend to think of words, right? Phonemes that we can speak. But language, written language, only evolved around 5,000 years ago. So prior to written language, we still had symbols. But those symbols were much more directly tied to their iconical and indexical underpinnings. So as we begin to look at these artifacts in later chapters, it's obvious that they are symbolic things. They have meanings that, that refer to a semantic web of relationships, but those meanings are also much more clearly linked to the icons and indices which underlie them. And so because of that, looking at these artifacts gives us a really fantastic window into the origin of language and the origin of symbolic thought in general. It allows us to, to really build this map from icons all the way up to symbols without ever using words, which I think is really, really fascinating. So now let's, what does she have to say about symbols? This present work grows out of the vast body of symbols preserved in the actual artifacts themselves. My primary presupposition is that they can best be understood on their own planes of reference, grouped according to their inner coherence. They constitute a complex system of which every unit is interlocked with every other in what appear to be specific categories. No symbol can be treated in isolation. Understanding the part leads to understanding the whole, which in turn leads to understanding, identifying more of the parts, right? So this is this claim about the holistic nature of symbolic webs that in some sense, the only way to understand any of the parts is to understand the whole. And I think also this claim has something to do with the holistic nature of the religion that she's going to be describing. Uh, so it, we can contrast it with the, the reductionistic paradigms of today, which divide the world into little atoms, that the, the worldview of these pre-linguistic people making these artifacts was much more holistic and integrated than the worldview that we have today. And I think that that holism is something that is worth reconsidering. This book explicitly seeks, seeks to identify the old European patterns that cross the boundaries of time and space. 
these systematic associations in the Near East, Southeastern Europe, and Mediterranean area, and in Central, Western, and Northern Europe, indicate the extension of the same goddess religion to all these regions as a cohesive and persistent ideological system. I do not believe, as many archaeologists in this generation seem to, that we shall never know the meaning of prehistoric art and religion. Yes, the scarcity of sources makes reconstruction difficult and in most, in most instances, but the religion of the early agricultural period of Europe and Anatolia is very richly documented. Tombs, temples, frescoes, reliefs, sculptures, figurines, pictorial paintings, and, for, and other sources need to be analyzed from the point of view of ideology. For this reason, it is necessary to widen the scope of descriptive archaeology into interdisciplinary research. For this work, I lean heavily on comparative mythology, early historical sources, and linguistics, as well as folklore and historical ethnography. Continuing. The world of the goddess implies the whole realm in which she is manifested herself. What were her major functions? What were the relations between her and her animals, plants, and the rest of nature? Her place in prehistory and early history as a cosmogenic figure, the universal fruitful source, is no longer a novelty to many readers. In a number of books by religious historians, mythologists, and psychologists, she has been described as the great mother who gives birth to all things from her womb. She is usually represented in as well-known Paleolithic Venuses and figurines from Neolithic Europe and Anatolia or from Bronze Age Crete. Analogies for her were sought from around the world, pre-Vedic Asia, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Amer American Indian cultures, and elsewhere. These were simplistic and presented without the benefit of background studies. In order not to base my interpretation of symbols and functions of the divinities on such accidental analogies from all the continents of the world, I have focused my research strictly on European evidence, but including all the Neolithic and subsequent cultures, phase by phase. She goes from, from Paleolithic, actually, Paleolithic cultures of 30,000 years ago, all the way up to, to the Minoan culture of about 4,000 years ago. Then I follow the continuity of symbols and images forward to later prehistoric and historic times, and also backwards, tracing their origin to the Paleolithic. The materials available for the study of old European symbols are as vast and as the neglect, uh, sorry, the materials available for the study of old European symbols are as vast as the neglect that has been accorded that study. Of this rich body of material, the assemblage of ritual ceramics and other objects marked with symbols is most complete. The miniature sculptures, called figurines, found in quantity in almost every Neolithic settlement and cemetery, are invaluable for reconstructing not only the symbolism but the religion itself. Because rituals were reenacted using these stone, ivory, bone, and clay figurines, much of the content of this prehistoric religion has been preserved. The tradition of marking figurines and other cult objects with symbols allows us to decipher their functions. The richest sites where temples and paintings have been preserved are of paramount importance recreating these divinities, their functions, and their associated rituals. Findings at Katal Hayuk in central Anatolia, dating from around 6400 to 5600 BC, in the un uncalibrated chronology, the suggested accurate age from the... Okay, anyway. Katal Hayuk is like 9,000 years old. I'm, I'm not going to read the footnotes. Were made by James Mellart in the 1960s. My own excavations at, at Chelyan Thessaly in 1973-74 uncovered some of the earliest European temples of 6000 BC. The discover that's 8,000 years ago. <laughs> the discovery of Mesolithic and early Neolithic sacred burial areas at Lipinski Vir and Vlasak on the Danube in northern Yugoslavia, excavated by Dr. Serjevic and Z by D. Serojic and Z. Letica in the 1960s, contributed precious information on the funerary rituals and sculptures of divinities associated with regeneration. A remarkable surge of discoveries in Bulgaria. Romania, Moldova, and the western Ukraine after World War II revealed treasures of sculptures and painted pottery, as well as temples and temple models. Most of these date from the 6th and 5th millenniums BC. In the Mediterranean area, in addition to the great temples and tombs of Malta known from the early decades of the 20th century, excavations in Sardinia have revealed rock-cut and subterranean tombs, another rich source of information on funerary rituals and associated symbolism. 
the art and engravings of megalithic tombs along the Atlantic coast of Western and Northwestern Europe and the British Isles provide valuable insights into the beliefs linked with death and regeneration. Most of the illustrations reproduced here date from 6500 to 3500 BC in southeastern Europe and about 4500 to 2500 in Western Europe. The Neolithic began considerably later in the West. Examples from the Upper Paleolithic are also included to demonstrate the amazing longevity of certain images and designs. However, their persistence into the Bronze Age is not to be ignored. In fact, most of the in fact, being more evolved than their predecessors and full of life-affirming grapes, the motifs of Bronze Age, Cyprus, Greet, Thera, Sardinia, Sicily, and Malta are magnificent sources for our purpose. Therein and other Minoan shrines, frescoes, and ceramic and stone carvings and sculptures are of the highest quality in the old world ever created. Historic records, myth, and rituals show that much of this great artistic culture pervaded ancient Greece, Etruria, and other parts of Europe. So I um, put this, this, uh, this timeline here, which this next paragraph is about. So um, agricultural people's beliefs concerning sterility and fertility, the fragility of life and the constant threat of destruction and the periodic need to renew the regenerative processes of nature are among the most enduring. They live on to the present, as do very archaic aspects of the prehistoric goddess, in spite of the continuous process of erosion in the historic era. Passed on by grandmothers and mothers of the European family, the ancient beliefs survived the superimposition of the Indo-European and finally Christian myths. The goddess-centered religion existed for a very long time, much longer than the Indo-European and Christian, which represent relatively short periods of human history, leaving an indelible imprint on the Western psyche. So the early hunter goddess religion would have been from the origin of, of anatomically modern humans about 200,000 years ago to through the Mesolithic and, and Paleolithic and into the Neolithic at 10,000 BC. Then you have the agricultural goddess from 10,000 BC to about 2500 BC. Then you have the Indo-European invasion coming in from 25,000 BC to 0 BC of Indo-European beliefs, which then at 0 AD or you know maybe 600 AD or whatever the Christian overruns. So the agricultural goddess religion, which m this book is about, lasted 7,500 years, right? which is, that's just, it's just an imponderably long time. And so what she's saying about Minoan and Crete is that in these islands, which were more isolated in the Mediterranean, you have this flowering of the goddess religion that verges on linguistic, like linear A and linear B in, in Crete. Um, so the Minoan religion is sort of this like, the the pinnacle of a lot of these goddess ideas which would have emerged out of the mesolithic and paleolithic and most of these artifacts are are neolithic artifacts and but the minoan artifacts provide this really great sort of like crystallization of the ideas or clarification because the symbolism is much more rich and much better preserved um, but her claim is that there's continuity throughout. So you can look at these artifacts from 25,000 years ago and see that they have the same symbolic motifs as artifacts from Crete 4,000 years ago. And that's just, it's just extraordinary. Um, continuing on. The ancient beliefs that were recorded in historical times, or those that are still extant in rural and peripheral areas of Europe, removed from those turbulences of European history, particularly in Basque, Breton, Welsh, Irish, Scottish, and Scandinavian countries, or where Christianity was introduced very late, as in Lithuania, officially in 1387, but in reality not before the end of the 16th century, are essential to the understanding of prehistoric symbols, since these later versions are known to us in their ritual and mythic contexts. This volume is a study of archaeomythology, a field that includes archaeology, comparative mythology, and folklore, and one that archaeologists have yet to explore. The mythologists, on their part, have ignored the rich archaeological sources in spite of enormous possibilities they provide. It is hoped that this work will open avenues to folklore treasures as other source for reconstructing prehistoric ideology. Further research should yield a rich harvest. 
recognizing two different symbolic systems, one reflecting a matriistic Gylandic Gylanic culture, Gylanic means agendered, not patriarchy nor matriarchy, and the other endocratic, um, as in patriarchal, I guess, within European prehistoric and historical mythology, will enlighten the stories of origins of myths and symbols. De Musil, 1898 to 1986, devoted his life work to establishing mythology as an independent branch of the social sciences. His studies have shown that mythic beings are the means for explaining the order of mankind and the origins of the universe, and that mythic thinking is not accidental but occurs within an organized system of divine activities and functions. Thus, mythology reflects an ideological structure. Comparative studies show Indo-European mythology and society as consisting of three classes, sovereign, warrior, and pastoral agricultural, these relative to divine functions in the three realms of the sacred, of physical force, and of prosperity. This is the Indo-European belief. So Indo-European belief has this triadic system of rulers, warriors, and, and farmers, right? So comparative studies show Indo-European mythology and society as consisting of three classes, sovereign, warrior, and pastoral agricultural. These relate to divine functions in the three realms of the sacred, of physical force, of the three realms of the sacred, of physical force, and of prosperity. So the sovereign is the sacred realm, the warrior is the physical force, and the pastoral is prosperity. Thus, the first light was shown on the nature of the Indo-European life and ideology. Unfortunately, de Musil, mainly because he did not use archaeological sources, dissociated his system of three functions from the preceding matriarchal system that reflected an entirely different pantheon of goddesses and of a different social structure. This is where his model failed. Typically, old European goddesses were relegated to the third function, prosperity or fertility, and thus became grouped as the lowest gods, deux derinaires. In some contexts, however, for instance in dealing with the Greek Athena or Iris Machas, de Musil admitted that the goddesses are multifunctional, performing in all three realms. In one of his works, he even states that they form the thorn in his system. It is clear that Indo-European mythologies are mixed with pre-Indo-European, and that a reliable system cannot be reconstructed without first distinguishing and then weeding out these earlier elements. So we're talking about phylogeny. We're doing mythological phylogeny here, precisely as the evolutionists do, or the philologists before them. De Musil's model does not work if applied to these hybrid mythologies. The goddesses inherited from old Europe, such as Greek Athena, Hera, Artemis, Hecate, Roman Minerva and Diana, Irish Morrigan and Bridget, Baltic Lima and Ragana, Russian Baba Yaga, Basque Mari, and others are not Venuses bringing fertility and, pro and prosperity, as we shall see they are much more. These life-givers and death-wielders are queens, or ladies, and as such they remained in individual creeds for a very long time in spite of their, in spite of their official dethronement, militarization, and hybridization with the Indo-European heavenly brides and wives. The old European goddesses never became deses decineres, even in Christian times. All this calls for a vertical explanation of the de Musilian method. So by vertical explanation, I'm going to interpret it as evolutionary explanation, that there's our religious beliefs and our symbolism comes from a common ancestor, a prehistoric ancestor, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and it has evolved and branched until today. So if we want to understand the religious beliefs of today, the, the sort of modern monotheistic faiths or, or you know, the, the Buddhist philosophy of nothingness and all, all of this highly sophisticated metaphysical systems, we need to go back to the beginning, right? This is the same, this is the same claim as Deacon's claim about the origin of, of, of semiotics, that if you want to understand the origin of meaning, you need to go back to the origin of life. Well, the same goes for our religious beliefs and our metaphysical beliefs, that if you want to get to their origin, we need to start at the beginning, and that's here. That's what this book attempts to describe, is the, the universal religion that all of the subsequent religious beliefs came out of. And if we can paint this phylogeny, if we can say, oh, here's the influence of the goddess religion and here's how the Indo-European influence came to affect it and all these things, we'll be a lot closer to understanding the sort of innateness of religious belief, I think. Um, so, archaeological materials are not mute. They speak their own language and they need to be used for a 
they need and they need to be used for the great source of help uh, sorry archaeological materials are not mute they speak their own language right there's this unique language of artifacts with its own symbolism that we can decode and these artifacts they need to be used for the great source they are to help unravel the spirituality of those of our ancestors who predate the indo-europeans by many thousands of years my focus is on the period beginning with early agriculture in Europe, some nine to 8,000 years ago. Right now, that date has been expanded to maybe even 15,000 years ago in the Eastern Mediterranean, but moving on. The Neolithic farmers evolved their own cultural patterns in the course of several millennia. Food gathering gave way to food producing and hunting to a settled way of life, but there was no corresponding major change in the structure of symbolism, only a gradual incorporation of new forms and the elaboration or transformation of the old. Indeed, what is striking is not the metamorphosis of the symbols over the millennia, but rather the continuity from pale Paleolithic times on. The major aspects of the goddess of the Neolithic, the birth giver, portrayed in a naturalistic birth giving pose, the fertility giver, influencing growth and multiplication, portrayed as a pregnant nude, and life or nourishment giver and protectus, portrayed as a bird woman with breasts and protruding buttocks, and the death wielder as the stiff nude bone, can all be traced back to the period when the first sculptures of bone, ivory, and stone appeared around 25,000 BC, and their symbols, vulvas, triangles, breasts, chevrons, zigzags, meanders, cut marks, to an even earlier time. The main theme of goddess symbols is, of goddess symbolism is the mystery of birth and death and the renewal of life not only human, but all life on earth, and indeed the whole cosmos. Symbols and images cluster around the parthenogenic self-generating goddess and her basic functions as giver of life, wielder of death, and not less importantly, the ge as regeneratrix. And around the earth, and around the earth mother, the fertility goddess, young and old, rising and dying with plant life. She was the single source of all life, who took her energy from the springs and wells, from sun, the moon, and moist earth. This symbolic re system represents cyclical, not linear time. So I wrote this note here, cyclical time, cyclical system, symbol system, everything connected to everything else. Words on a page are linear, and so they help us perceive time linearly. Symbols on an artifact must be perceived all at once. Right, so this is this claim about the the role that the Abrahamic faiths have in in producing modern Western consciousness and particularly science. The Abrahamic faiths create this division between the divine world and the physical world, and they have this notion of history, right? God said to Abraham, I will make your people a chosen people and they will be as plentiful as grains of sand on the earth. Right. And, and so the, the idea of Jesus is like this messianic king is coming. So history is progress. We are moving in a forward direction. And we have that myth so, so strongly in modern Western society. Oh, you know, the newest iPhone 7, it's coming out. Right. The the uh, the singularity is coming. We're going to colonize Mars like progress is here. Right. And, and, and we're constantly moving forward. And and we have this perception of the arrow of time. You know why? was the universe so well ordered in the beginning and why is time flowing in one direction but the metaphysics of this earlier time right this this goddess religion didn't have that notion of progress because history as as we understand it didn't exist history came into being with writing with this linear linear translation of ideas into symbols that have a beginning and end but in these artifacts the way that you need to read them is holistically they don't have beginnings and ends their message is simple and comes at you all at once so in terms of thinking about time this religion offers some really really interesting insights into other ways of thinking about time right and and the the hindu system still has this this you know cycles of of death and rebirth samsara um, and that used to be the universal way that we perceived things because there were no empires and kings to like change the social order in a generation. Like life for your grandparents was the same as life for their grandparents and the same for their grandparents and on and on and on. You have this sort of like unchanging social structure which contributed to a cyclical 
understanding of time, that everything that is, was, and will be again. So this symbolic system represents cyclical, not linear, mythical time. And in, and in art, this is manifested by the signs of dynamic motion, whirling and twisting spirals, winding and coiling snakes, circles, crescents, horns, sprouting seeds and shoots. The snake was a symbol of life energy and regeneration, a most benevolent, not evil creature. Even the colors had different meanings than in the Indo-European symbolic system. Black did not mean death or the underworld. It was the color of fertility, the color of damp caves and rich soil of the womb of the goddess where life begins. White, on the other hand, was the color of death, of bones. The opposite of the Indo-European system in which both white and yellow are colors of the shining sky and the sun. In no way... Could the philosophy that produced these images be mistaken for the pastoral Indo-European world with its horse-riding warrior gods of thundering and shining sky, or of the swampy underworld, the ideology in which female goddesses are not creatrixes but beauties, Venuses, brides of the sky gods? The goddess-centered art, with its striking absence of images of warfare and male domination, reflects a social order in which women as heads of clans or queen priestesses played a central part. Old Europe and Anatolia, as well as Minoan Crete, were Gailani. So let's go down to define this word. Oh, the scrolling is so slow. Gailani, I believe, is... Um, Okay, here we go. From Rihanna Einsler in her book The Chalice and the Blade, 1987, proposes the term Gailani, Guy from woman and Anne from Andros man, and the letter L between the two standing for the linking of both halves of humanity, for the social structure in which both sexes are equal. So Gailani is a social structure in which both sexes are equal. And now, okay. Um, were a Gailani, a balanced, non-patriarchal, non-matriarchal social system is reflected by religion, mythologies, and folklore, by studies of the social structure of old European and Minoan cultures, and is supported by the continuity of the elements of a matrilineal system in ancient Greece, Etruria, Rome, the Basque, and other countries of Europe. While European cultures continued a peaceful existence and reached a true fluorescence of sophistication in art and architecture in the 5th millennium BC, a very different Neolithic culture with the domesticated horse and lethal weapons emerged in the Volga Basin of South Russia and after the middle of the 5th millennium even west of the Black Sea. This new force inevitably changed the course of European prehistory. I call it the Kurgan culture, Kurgan meaning barrow in Russian, since the dead were buried in round barrows that covered the mortuary houses of important males. The basic features of the Kurgan culture go back to the 7th and 6th millenniums BC in the Middle and Lower Volga Basin, patriarchy, patrilineity, small-scale agriculture, and animal husbandry, including the domestication of the horse not later than the 6th millennium, the eminent place of the horse in the cult, of the end of great importance, armaments, bow and arrow, spear, and dagger. These characteristics match what has been reconstructed as Proto-Indo-European by means of linguistic studies and by comparative mythology. They stand in opposition to the old European, Gailanic, peaceful, sedentary culture with highly developed agriculture and with great architectural, sculptural, and ceramic traditions. So, the repeated disturbances and incursions by Kurgan people, who I view, who I view as Proto-Indo-European, put an end to the old European culture roughly between 4300 and 2800 BC, changing it from Gailanic to Androcratic and from matrilineal to patrilineal. The Aegean and Mediterranean regions and Western Europe escaped the process the longest. There, especially in islands such as Thera, Crete, Malta, and Sardinia, old European culture flourished in an inevitably peaceful and creative civilization until 1500 BC, a thousand to 1500 years after Central Europe has been thoroughly transformed. Nevertheless, the goddess religion and its symbols survived as an undercurrent in many areas. Actually, many of these symbols are still present as images in our art and literature, powerful motifs in our myths and archetypes, and in our dreams. We are still living under the sway of that aggressive male invasion and only beginning to discover our long alienation from our authentic European heritage, Gailanic, non-violent, earth-centered culture. 
This book represents for the first time the concrete evidence of this long-standing culture and its symbolic language, whose vestices remain enmeshed in our own system of symbols. All right, so that is the introduction to the language of the goddess by Maria Gimbitas. I'm looking forward to the next video where we get to actually dig into some of this symbolism.